On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Where Are The Rivers? Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCoglan, and welcome to today's episode. So, there are a lot of people that debate the different aspects of climate change, what causes weather and climate to go through cycles. I, I'm not here to do that. What I'm here to talk about today is what's happening right now and what we're experiencing. And what we're clearly experiencing right now is severe droughts which are lowering the levels of rivers, not just the Mississippi River, which we've reported on previously on this channel, but rivers around the world. Uh, we're talking about the Rhine, we're talking about the Yangtze, we're talking about the major river systems in South America. All of these are having an impact, not just on food transportation and the transportation of goods, but on power production, on water reclamation, on drinking water, you name it. It's having a severe impact. And what I want to talk about today is that impact, particularly as it deals with global shipping, but also other aspects that you may not be thinking about that we probably need to delve into. So before we do that, if you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's go ahead and jump into these stories. So G Captain had this Bloomberg story that I thought was really excellent, a good overview here on what is happening entitled waterways and lakes are evaporating worldwide. I just want to read the introduction here. The world rivers are evaporating, and this could be devastating for our food supply, our cities, and our transportation. Inland barges are 10 times more efficient than trucks, and dams are the world's biggest source of clean electricity. But they will rely on rivers for their water. If the rivers dry up, the climate... Uh, could be in big trouble. And in particularly, this story starts off with the story of the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze, which is a massive, massive production of electricity for China. It produces enough electricity to power all of the Philippines. However, it's not running right now because water levels on the Yangtze are so low that you don't see it producing power at this time. And what we're seeing is globally this impact. We're seeing it not just on the Yangtze River, but we're seeing it on the Rhine River, where Rhine water levels fall below, or have fallen below key points that are really limiting trade up and down the Rhine River. Remember, the Rhine goes into the interior of Europe, but it also connects to the Main and the Danube, which goes all the way to the Black Sea. There's a massive inland waterway system that Europe uses. We've talked about the Parana River in Argentina. This is the river between Argentina, Uruguay, that is uh, fed out into the Rio de Plata. This goes up into the interior of Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and is used for the export of essential grain. And it, too, has gone dry. And then, of course, the Mississippi River which is one we've talked about quite a bit here, has also experienced this drought. So we're talking about four major rivers on four different continents, all experiencing drought at the same time with massive implications. So this Bloomberg piece goes about the idea of talking about the global water shortage and what this drought means. Uh, this is talk, There's a quote in here. It's talking about this. The worst drought in 1,200 years this year in the U.S. West means parts of reservoirs can only churn out half the power they normally supply to California, increasing the risks of rolling blackouts. Nationwide hydro generation fell to 17.06 terawatt hours in September. It was expected to plummet further in October, according to the Energy Information Agency. This is the lowest in September 2016. There's a couple of tweets here by Joe uh, Weisenthal, who does the Odd Lots podcast podcast for Bloomberg that I've been on. And he's talking about this story. It goes on here to talk about water levels around the world, Brazil, Asia, it talks about Lake Mead and the Hoover Dam, which provides 90% of the water supply for Las Vegas being at critical low levels. This is the same water supply that goes in to feed Los Angeles and irrigate the entire area around the Colorado River Basin. And in particular, it comes back to talk about China, but let's focus on the U.S. and the Mississippi River for a minute, because I think we really need to put this into a little bit of context of what's happening in terms of trade up and down the river. So I go over this story on freight waves by John Kingston. Relief still far off for low Mississippi River, hindering barge movement. 
come down here and we see some of the key stories here. I apologize. Uh, my poor eyes. I've got to put on my glasses for this. Uh, some recent rains in the basin that ultimately dump in the Mississippi are a start, but the barge shipping problems that have created enormous backups on the river, particularly near Memphis, Tennessee, remain a long way from resolution. Uh, the Coast Guard said this on Monday to Freight Waves. Current water levels are the lowest we've seen in recent years, and some locations have reached or surpassed historic l- low water levels set as far back as 1988. These conditions have created significant navigation hazards to the marine transportation system. So not only do you have low water on the Mississippi, this means that barges south of St. Louis, which normally can push 40 barges, have now been limited to 25. Not only that, you're limiting the draft of those barges, meaning you've got to take cargo out of those barges. So the amount of cargo throughput that's going through is significantly less. You've got the Army Corps of Engineers dredging to kind of funnel the water into the deepest parts of the channel. At the same time, you've got the Coast Guard in there having to reset buoys, remove chain from buoys, because now at low water, the buoys are drifting further away from their center point, and that makes it look like the channel may be moving or not in its exact position. All of that takes time. Go on here. The Coast Guard said that uh, there's a closure near Memphis that has a queue of three vessels and 39 barges northbound and a much larger group of 51 vessels and 217 barges southbound. And we're seeing these closures all up and down the Mississippi River right here. Uh, goes on here, a river stage at a point is not an absolute measure of the depth of the Warren Channel, rather is the depth with respect to a historical leather, level, the National Weather Service said. In summary, when a river gauge ne- reads zero or in the negative numbers, it does not mean the river has gone totally dry or is running below ground. It means the gauge is reading at or below the agreed upon zero level. This is the Mississippi River at Memphis. I'm going to go ahead and take you over to that same gauge currently. Here, this is from the U.S. National Weather Service. This is the Missis- this is the Memphis gauge right here that we're talking about. Let's go ahead and take a look at it as it pulls up here. And what you'll see right there is we're sitting at about minus 923 feet. And that's where we're sitting at right now with an expected to come up just a little bit, but we're well below the low water stage where we normally are. And if you look at this map again, you'll see the brown. The brown indicates low water, and it's all the way down the Mississippi from Cairo at the intersection of the Ohio River and the Mississippi all the way down the river until you get below Vicksburg and Natchez, which is a big problem. And the reason for this is very simple. It's the drought. It is a massive drought. When you look at these drought, in particularly the area from Texas, north up into montana those particularly right here are astride major rivers river systems they're not getting the water dumped into them like they normally do what does that mean that means that the mississippi below st louis which is doesn't have locks or dams above st louis you do from st louis to st paul you have a series of locks and dams that hold the water in lower mississippi doesn't and what this means is the river is getting exceptionally low. I'll give you another bad case scenario. If the river gets too low, you may actually see the ocean start coming up the river down in New Orleans, which means you'll have salt water, brackish water coming into freshwater environments that has the potential to kill wildlife, can kill uh, plants and, and vegetation. This could be really detrimental. And go back to that John Kings, Kingston story right here. Again, just kind of looking at the rest of the story here, he talks about, I want to come down here to the end of it. Uh, Amid uncertainty about when barge traffic will normalize, some grain shippers have delayed deliveries until later in the year, which has softened demand for barges. But even with that decline, the report said that spot rate is up 130% from a year ago and it has risen 260% from the three-year average. So we're talking about maybe declining shipping, yet at the same time, we're talking about higher cost for barges. That means more expensive grain. That means the grain that's getting out is going to be more expensive. This is at the same time we're talking about cutting back on Ukrainian grain as Russia is talking about not renewing the UN Black Sea grain deal. And then we're dealing with these issues around the world. Let's take a quick look at marine traffic and see what these situations look like in terms of vessel movement. So here is the Mississippi River and the uh, Ohio River in the United States. The blue there represents tugs and barges in that area. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit right here, pull it up. 
and you'll see this area. We're going to come right here around Memphis and take a look. When you see the, the small vessel symbols with the uh, points on them, those are vessels that are moving. The ones with round are vessels that are stopped. And you'll see the queues up here north of Memphis and then in the south below here. Very, you know, what we're expecting to see here. Very slow barge traffic moving up. It's congregating up here in the north and down here at the south. If we zoom out here and go around the world, let's go over here to South America. And the Piranha, you'll see that river right here where we're talking about coming out of Argentina into Uruguay and up to Paraguay. Sorry, I went the wrong way there. There we go. So right here, the, the Pl uh, Plata River right here, a big, huge, massive kind of basin right here, Buenos Aires, Montevideo. And then as you head up the river above uh, Rosario, heading up here to the confluence, you'll see up on this tributary, very few vessels, almost no vessels up here and very few vessels right now up on the Piranha River. That story talks about the fact that elements of the Piranha River are showing that have never shown before. Head across, head over to Europe. One of the things you never appreciate is the inland waterway system of Europe. There'll be a lot of comparisons between the United States and its inland waterway system. But, you know, if you just take a look, uh, this is the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany right here. I mean, if you look at the river systems, here's the Rhine River coming up here, massive river. And then you get the tributaries off the Rhine, all looping in around here through Belgium. Belgium and Netherlands, remember, is below water levels. So you have these canals and river systems that run throughout the system. But as water levels recede, particularly in the Rhine River, what we're seeing here is a diminution of the amount of traffic coming across here. And when you look at this, here's the Rhine. This goes all the way across. This stream here is the main, and then it dumps into the Danube here in Austria and takes you all the way down Austria into Hungary, into Serbia, Croatia, Bosnia, Romania, and then out here into the Black Sea, out here by the Danube and Constana. So, I mean, you see how, how significant the, the Rhine River is. And then finally, we'll head over here to the last of those river systems that was mentioned in that report, and that is the Yangtze. And the Yangtze has always been at the core of China and its elements. You can see right here how much it plays a part. Here you see the massive you know, conglomeration of ships off Shanghai, but then the Yangtze running all the way up here into the vast interior of China. And obviously wo low water levels there are hindering the traffic moving up here, which again raises the question about this. Well, all this river traffic being slowed down, we're seeing food slow down. Is there any positives to this that we're seeing? And in truth, the only thing I see is two positives from it. Number one, this one right here, which kind of the archaeologist in me comes out in this, that because of this extreme heat and low water, we're finding a lot of wrecks in archaeological rigs. So extreme heat is uncovering lost villages, ancient ruins and shipwrecks. They just found a uh, old Higgins boat, an LCVP uh, amphibious craft up on Lake Mead of all places. But, I mean, we're finding Roman ruins, Spanish ghost villages. We're finding the grim reality of bodies, actually, in the bottom uh, of Lake Mead by Hoover Dam. Uh, Shackleton's record, uh, secret gardens, uh, which have been uh, found in Great Britain, Mesopotamian treasures, and a lot of people out there hunting relics right now. So uh, for terms of archaeology, yeah, this is a great thing. Terrible for the, for the, for the planet. But for archaeologists and our history, it's a great thing. The other element I would add here is we're also looking at alternatives. And so, for example, on the Mississippi River, one of the alternatives that exist is something called the Ten Tom Waterway that links together. It's a canal system that links together the Tennessee River and uh, the uh, uh, Tom Bigby River, which comes out of Mobile in Alabama. And you'll see right here at Themalopolis all the way up to Corinth in Ikua, uh, this is right by the old Shiloh battlefield, is this canal with a series of locks and dams, what's known as the Ten Tom Waterway. Links together these two rivers. It's an alternative source. Now, it's much smaller 
and size limited than the Mississippi is. That's the key thing about the lower Mississippi is you can get these huge budge, uh, toes down, tow boats and uh, toes down there. Not as big down the 10 Tom, but it is an alternative source that can be used. If we zoom out here and go ahead and head back over to the United States and take a look at that, one of the things you'll see right there is that it is being used. You can see that waterway right here being used kind of parallel to the Mississippi River. This right here is the 10 Tom. And you can see it being done with waterways going all the way up to Nashville, up to Birmingham, Huntsville. Again, a significant amount of traffic being used, even all the way up to Chattanooga, for example. They're able to hook into the 10 Tom and come out here in Mobile. Now, Mobile does not have the facilities yet to handle the volume of grain and everything coming out of it. It is secondary to the southern Louisiana facilities. But again, it may be an alternative that people start looking at. So obviously a lot of issues going on here with waterways and the current drought situation we're facing. The United States, South America, Europe, China, all facing these issues, all dealing with this. This is having an impact on the global shipment of food around the world. If you enjoyed today's video, please take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, give it a thumbs up, share it across social media, all those things help hit the algorithm on YouTube and gets this channel out there to more people. So please take your time, go ahead and do that. Leave a comment, let me know if I missed anything or if there's anything else you want me to go in depth with and just let me know. So until our next video, this is Sal signing off.